presentation. And now, Sorry? as I said before, it's a great no, pleasure no, um, no. to announce no. our next keynote speaker, Peter. And the topic is, are you the right investor to, to be backed by an angel? Um, next to that, Peter is great fun. Um, I'm pretty sure that with his uh, past investments during all over Europe and all over the world, um, he's the right guy to give us some really interesting insights in the whole uh, business angel community. So I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks a lot, Peter. Thank you, man. Thank you. Hey. So, um, actually, before I start, how many, uh, how many entrepreneurs in the audience? I just see a show of hands. Wow, that's a lot. And how many angel investors? <laughs> Four, five. Okay. Actually, Christina, could you take a picture of these guys, the, the angel investors? Where are you? There you are. Yeah, take a picture. Keep your hands up. We want, we want to be able to name you. So that all these entrepreneurs know to who to go and speak to. Thank you. <laughs> That's right, individual mugshots. Um, so uh, I'm supposed to speak about, are you the kind of entrepreneur that angel investors want to back? And um, it, it, just the very title actually implies the conventional logic flow there. And the conventional logic flow is you entrepreneurs impress me, I give you money. And, um, and we can certainly talk about that, but actually, of course, the reality is, is very much the other way around as well. So I have to impress you, you give me shares. I have to earn the right um, to, be, to be able to invest in your business and to be a fellow traveler in your you know, entrepreneurial journey. Um, and, and by the way, I think that's true whether you're at a very, very early stage, at the angel stage, or whether it's later. You should expect the investor to try to impress you. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that. So at the beginning, if you're trying to impress me, um, you know, what, what is it that I look for? And there are a couple of things, really. Um, and actually, it, there's, there's an old uh, McKinsey-inspired framework that I use to think about businesses, some demand-side stuff, some supply-side stuff, some economic stuff. I'll go through that. But bear in mind that, certainly for me, it is really less about the answers that you're giving me and more about the way you answer them. Actually, a friend of mine who's a, another angel investor says his likelihood of investing is inversely correlated to the number of PowerPoint slides. So that's probably a good indicator. Um, so what I mean by that, you know, I would expect in our first conversation with, a, with an entrepreneur to talk a little bit about the demand side stuff. So what do you know about your customers? What do they need? Um, what, uh, what is their willingness to pay? What's your product market fit? Um, how big is the market? How fast is the market growing? All that kind of stuff. And again, it's not about the answers. It's about the way you answer, the passion you have for it. The supply side stuff is really, um, you know, who are your competitors? and how are you differentiated from them? What's the source of sustainable, competitive, differentiated advantage, which I know sounds very McKinsey, but it's actually quite a helpful way of thinking things. And in my experience, the differentiation is largely to do with the team and the talent. We'll come back to that. But it could also be to do with some unique technology. It could be some strategic partners you have. Um, you know, there are other sort of unfair advantages that you might have that other people don't. So we should talk about that. The third bucket is around economics. And there it's simply, certainly at the angel stage, it is, you know, what is the, what is the business model? But, but only a kind of a rough approximation of the business model, a vague sense of what are the revenue drivers, what are the cost drivers, what's the capital intensity of the business, and probably a little bit of thinking about you know, the exit. Are you expecting this eventually to IPO? Is this eventually a, a sale to a, a European media company? Or are you going to sell it to Google, Apple, Facebook? Again, you're right at the beginning of that journey. So it's, a, it's just sort of vague thinking. So that's how, you know, I would expect you to impress me by your, the way you answer those kind of questions. But let's get back to the way I would try to impress you. Um, and actually, as some of you know, probably I would try to start by uh, introducing you to my three daughters, who are um, a ten times smarter than I am and much better behaved, but they're also digital natives, and they have very strong instincts about digital products, uh, which frankly I just don't. And actually, my 21-year-old daughter is becoming an entrepreneur, 
Um, and rather interestingly, I've offered to invest, but she hasn't accepted yet. So <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see how that plays out. Um, but then how do I try to impress you? Um, so mainly, it would be around introducing you to talent, to other talented people. Actually, ideally to people who are as equally as talented as you, but often you know, even more talented. And those could be you know, other co-founders, they could be employees, it could be uh, other investors, it often is, it could be strategic partners, it could be board members, advisors, it could be a whole bunch of things, talented people. Um, I think it's helpful to think about talent in, um, in two ways. One is uh, you know, hard talent, hard skills, coding, finance, UX design, and the other is soft skills, soft talent. And actually, I was talking to my middle daughter, my 18-year-old, about this, and she said, oh, you mean like Aristotle? Um, I told you, she's at least 10 times smarter than I am. And I said, in what sense? She said, well, Aristotle divided wisdom into Sophia, which is theoretical wisdom, which is the, the hard stuff, and phronesis, uh, which is practical wisdom, which is the, the softer stuff. Um, and so I actually think there are probably two buckets of soft skills, soft talent, and that is helpful to think about. Um, one is the really about protecting the downside of being an entrepreneur, and the other is unlocking the upside of being an entrepreneur. And what I mean by each of those, so on, on protecting the downside, it is the skills that are around a, a high tolerance for ambiguity. You're living in a very, very uncertain, change dynamic environment. Um, the stress and anxiety that's likely to go along with that and therefore the ability to manage that stress to, um, to, to be able to deal with it. Um, it's also to do with focus and a passion and integrity, especially when the going gets tough, to kind of not cut corners on integrity stuff. Um, one of my favorite examples is, um, probably shouldn't have favorite examples, but uh, Ian Hogarth and Michelle and Pete, who are the co-founders of uh, Songkick, in which I'm lucky enough to be an investor. And that's, uh, that's the live music industry. It's a tough world. And very early on, there were a lot of conversations, and they always took the high integrity route, which is not always the easiest way of doing it, but it's always the right way to do it. So those are the, you know, the skills, the talent for, that are very, very helpful in managing the the downside, if you like, of being an entrepreneur, basically resilience, right? A thousand people are going to tell you, no, can't be done, you can't have my money. So how do you develop that sort of resilience to deal with those conversations? It's tough. What I mean by the um, unlocking the upside is really around um, creativity and uh, uh, you know, actually having a, a refresh button. So how do you, as we all know, being an entrepreneur, you have to come up with brilliant ideas and different ways of doing things and disrupt. And then you have to keep changing it and keep evolving it and keep being creative and keep innovating and keep disrupting. And how do you keep that level of creativity? And how do you sort of unlock your brain to be able to kind of refresh, reset to zero and go again? And then more importantly, in a way, it is you know, having the self-awareness and not the self-centeredness, but the awareness of others as well, and uh, the empathy and the communication skills to be able to take other people on that journey with you. So you've got to have the vision and the creativity and the clarity in your own mind, but just as importantly, you've got to be able to transmit that to other people and weave a set of complex ideas into a very simple narrative and be able to take other people on that same journey with you. Really hard to do. Um, and so those are, I think, the protecting the downside skills and unlocking the upside skills that I like to think about. The big question is that it's actually you know, very hard to do that. Uh, in reality, it's relatively easy to learn the hard skills. It's relatively hard to learn the soft skills. And um, so I started trying to think about this um, four or five years ago and have spent a, a ton of time with, uh, with the, some of the top neuroscientists in the world. 
And because there's a lot of neuroscientific um, exploration of the mo at the moment around brain plasticity. So it turns out we've got 100 billion neurons up here, most of us, some of us slightly fewer, um, and they are plastic. You can regenerate neurons. You can uh, regenerate synapses between the neurons. Um, it's all part of epigenetics, so you know, your genes are not destiny. You're not locked into, you can change it. Um, and so that's the good news is that you know, the brain can change and this soft stuff, these soft skills can be learned and developed. Um, and I've spent a bit of time with these guys uh, trying to do that. So specifically on the protecting the downside stuff that I talked about, um, there is a, uh, there's an amazing professor, Mark Williams at uh, Oxford University. He's the uh, professor of clinical psychology and psychiatry. Um, at Oxford, and he also runs something called uh, the Oxford Mindfulness Center, and he has written a, a very good book called um, Finding Peace in a Frantic World, highly recommended, um, and it is a very, um, he has done a lot of work actually with very acutely traumatized brains, depressive brains, and even suicidal brains, um, and so a lot of his work, and I've been working with him, how can we take some of that and make it into and you know, help young entrepreneurs develop the kind of the protecting the downside skills that I'm talking about. Um, in interestingly, a group of other neuroscientists um, called Mindfulness in Schools have taken some of Mark Williams' stuff and applied it to kids at schools. So if you can teach mindfulness and uh, you know, anxiety and stress reduction to kids, you can definitely teach it to entrepreneurs. So I think there's something encouraging there. And actually, I've introduced both Mark and the Mindfulness in Schools people to a group in London, a pre-accelerator group uh, called Entrepreneur First, a, a brilliant organization run by two ex-McKinsey's, um, which takes 30 young entrepreneurs every year out of the top universities and gives them a year of pre-accelerator training. And they are starting to deliver some of this neuroscientist, neuroscience-based um, soft skills development, uh, which is kind of an interesting, I think, sort of first of, a, first of its kind experience. Um, on the unlocking the upside, uh, there is a, a, a brilliant professor, Felicia Huppert at Cambridge University, um, who is doing a ton of neuroscientific work on how to unlock creativity. So what's actually interesting to me about both of these threads is that um, these neuroscientists are now starting to prove what I guess the Buddhists have known for 2,500 years, um, which is that the brain can be shaped and that mindfulness is a great way to do that. And um, who in the room knows what mindfulness is? Right, very, very few. It's sort of, the technical definition is just the ability to focus the, your attention, awareness, on the present moment. So not being you know, despondent about what happened way back when in the past and not being anxious about what, or what might not happen in the future, but just being sort of present right here, right now. And you know, that might be meditation, um, but it might be more likely in my case, I have actually been meditating for about 20 years, but also I find I'm most mindful when I'm swimming or running and just doing something rhythmic. My wife is an oil painter. She is um, her, at her most mindful when she's painting. My youngest daughter is a singer. She is very mindful, deep breathing before and during her singing. So mindfulness, I think you can all do your mindfulness in whatever way you can. But the important thing is that these neuroscientists are now saying that mindfulness and many other techniques are helpful for reshaping the brain, using this plasticity of the brain to develop um, the soft skills that we're talking about. And I find that a very, very encouraging you know, direction of travel. And the fact that it is no longer really just kind of hippie, yogury, you know, this is really good, but it's actually anchored in neuroscience gives me uh, confidence that it's a very, very sort of promising direction for the future. Uh, that's probably a, a topic for a longer conversation another time. But I hope, that, I hope that's helpful in, under, in helping you understand how I think about hard skills, soft skills, and entrepreneurs. And I'm very open to, if we have time for questions, to talk a little bit more about that, to take some questions, if there are any. I can't see you, by the way. There's such a bright light. Yeah. Stunned silence. 
I have 58 seconds left anyway, so I guess we're, on, uh, we're in good time. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah.